May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. So you might not know this about me, but I am pretty good at losing stuff. I think that's one of the reasons that I like these parables so much. Carrie would not hesitate to confirm this fact. At one point, I even managed to find myself in quite a conundrum after losing my wallet on the very first day of a week-long trip in California. Luckily, someone else found it and mailed it back to me. And in fact, it got to my house before I did on the return trip. Over the years, in fact, I've had to develop habits to make losing more important things less likely, although I like to think I still have quite a knack for it. But that also means I've often experienced the joy of founding, finding those lost things. And I'd wager the joy felt at finding something you thought was lost is a nearly universal human experience. And it's the experience at the heart of today's parable, isn't it? Or parables. But as always, it's important to remember why Jesus is telling these parables. They don't just exist in the abstract, but are a response to the needs of the moment. In this case, what we find are the Pharisees and scribes annoyed about who Jesus is surrounding himself with. The scripture says they were grumbling because he welcomes and eats with sinners. Grumbling. It bothers them that Jesus eats with those they deemed unworthy. And so Jesus, in response to this, tells them and us a story. A story about a shepherd who lost a sheep first. And then a story about a woman who lost a coin. In a way, in fact, they're almost exactly the same story. A sheep was lost. A shepherd looked for the sheep. He found it and he celebrated. A coin was lost. A woman looked hard for it. She found it and she had a party. Something was lost. It was found. Then everyone rejoiced. Lost. Found. Rejoiced. So we might wonder as we think about what is Jesus trying to say to us in this moment? What does it mean to be lost? Is it being a sinner? Is, is that what Jesus means when he talks about being lost? That's probably a part of the truth. It's easy to read this and believe that the lost people in the story Jesus was trying to save are the sinners. And yet I wonder if the Pharisees and scribes are also lost in some ways. Maybe sinners too, they just weren't quite as aware of it as others. In a way, we're, all, of course, more like those Pharisees and scribes, typically. We tend to see ourselves as those who followed faithfully and wonder about those other people out there. But one commentator goes so far as to ask us, can we be righteous and also lost? Which is to say, can we be people who genuinely try to do the right things and still be lost? They pointedly ask, might the parents who want their children to succeed so much that they wrap their whole lives around hockey games and dance recitals be lost? Might the career-minded man or woman who's made moving up the ladder the one and only priority be lost? Might the folks who work jobs they hate just to give their family things they never had be lost? Might the senior who has a great pension but little sense of meaning since retirement be lost? Might the teen who works so hard to be perfect and who's willing to do just about anything to fit in be lost? Might the earnest Christian who's constantly asking whether people have accepted Jesus into their hearts be lost? I think his point is that even those of us who seek to follow Jesus faithfully can find ourselves lost all too easily. And it happens not because of a willful disobedience of God, but because one small step at a time we strayed from the life God intended for us without even realizing it. And maybe a big part of it is because we're so want, and it's so easy for us to see the sinners all over there and fail to see the one right here. But the good news of this passage, because it's about good news, is that God is always seeking out those who are lost. No matter where we found ourselves, there's a place at the table for us, for me, for you. And it's this steadfast insistence that the table is big enough for all that the religious authorities of the time find so unsettling. 
And that is the deep and abiding beauty of the good news. Jesus seeks to redeem us all. After all, that's the kind of love that's shown in the parable of the lost sheep, isn't it? To go and find the lost sheep, the shepherd had to leave behind 99 others. The one lost sheep so important, he chose to leave them to seek out this one. It doesn't seem like a particularly rational decision. It doesn't make sense from a mathematical standpoint. But the point seems to be that if the shepherd were to return and find another sheep missing, I think what would happen is he'd just go out to find that one until all will return home. Now, admittedly, not the most efficient strategy for a shepherd, but the point isn't about shepherds, is it? It's about God. The point of this parable seems to be to teach us something important about God's relationship with us, about who God is and who we are. And God is the one who seeks us out when we're lost. And God is the one who welcomes us with open arms Not because we're perfect, but because we're His. And God is the one who rejoices first when we're found. And so I think this passage is meant to remind us once more that God's love isn't about us being perfect. God seeks us even when we're lost, after all. And to hear once more that each time we come to Christ's table, the heavens truly rejoice. I invite you into trying to be a bit more aware of that today as you come to communion. To know that as you come to that table, God is rejoicing with us. And the heavens are celebrating. Amen.